Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Carrie Coogan, Deputy Director of Community Engagement and Public Affairs for the Kansas City Public Library. Thanks for coming out tonight. If you're joining us for the very first time, I hope you'll pick up one of our calendars. Looks like this. It tells you all about everything that we're doing here at the library, both at Central, at our plaza location, and then programs and services throughout our branch system. So we hope you'll take it with you. Also, you can sign up and get an e-blast as well. Um, let's see, what else? Today's program. We are so pleased to bring you the second installment of the library's four-part series on how to make entrepreneurship in Kansas City more inclusive, diverse, equitable, accessible, and liberating, more ideal for all. I want to thank our longtime and cherished partners and sponsors in this work, the Robert Reiner Foundation and the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for their help and support. It's Robert Rainier, sorry about that. Um, I'd also like to thank the tireless public affairs team and AV team who are here to help, and I especially want to point out Jen Tufts, who helped create this series. We are live streaming today, as you can see, um, and we will be showing this on the library's YouTube channel. So we invite anybody who's watching online to submit your questions into the chat, and we will be taking questions both here in this space, but also online as well. So please uh, think about what questions you might have. Now, to get us started, uh, and we'll be introducing our presenting speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce another inspiring entrepreneur, Chelsea M. Chelsea started her business, Kansas City Black Owned. <laughs> <laughs> like many successful <laughs> entrepreneurs, she saw a problem and she wanted to create a solution. <laughs> when Chelsea started KCBO in July of 2020, she just wanted to know where to shop black owned. At its core, KCBO is a growing modern day phone book. You can find it online at kcblackowned.org. It also lets people easily shop local and black owned. It helps people invest in black owned businesses and also those businesses near them. It helps these businesses not just stay alive, but also to thrive. As the KCBO website proudly reminds us, there is nothing better than shopping locally and supporting your community. <laughs> Please help me welcome to introduce our speaker for tonight, Chelsea M. <laughs> Hello, everybody. The, if you didn't get a cookie, please get a cookie. It was very good. I've had two. All right. Um, I get to talk to you today about my girl, Jackie. Um, she is a first generation daughter of um, a Vietnam War refugee. Jackie used to live in New York City. I think Kansas City is like a melting pot because I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. But nonetheless, it's about Jackie. She's from New York City. She was there for over 10 years as a Broadway actor. However, due to that pandemic, um, the arts took a huge pause, which caused Jackie to go on her next journey, entrepreneurship. Yay. Um, Cafe Cafe is Kansas City's first Vietnamese coffee shop, which just opened their first brick and mortar shop in Columbus Park. Let's clap for that. Yes. Um, they have other things if you don't drink coffee. I get the lemonade. Okay. And um, this caf the Cafe Cafe centers their shop around the culture of coffee, as well as amplifying the Asian and Asian American narrative in the Midwest. So I can't wait for you to meet my girl, Jackie. Um, she's just as silly as I. So here we go, Jackie. <laughs> Can you hear me at all? Yeah. This is good? Okay. I'm going to put this down just a little bit because I'm very tiny. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. I, as you can tell, I'm getting over a little cold. Um, I lost my voice earlier this week, and so I was just very like, oh my gosh, please let me get this voice back by the time I speak at the library. So hopefully you can still understand me. I might be coughing just a tiny bit. Um, not contagious. I'm okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm really grateful and blessed to be here and uh, to tell my story a little bit. I'm very open. I'm such an open book. And so if there are any questions, I'm going to leave a lot of time to talk because I want to really get to know the audience and get to know the people that are streaming and coming in. And yeah, oh, I have this little button thing. Let me make sure it works. 
Okay, I'm going to just start and introduce you to who I am. Hello, I'm Jackie Wynn. I am 34 years old. I am Vietnamese American. I am the daughter of a refugee. I wear it very proudly. Um, I'm a Broadway actor. Um, that's on pause for right now. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm also a human trying to figure it out. And I love to bring in a sense of humanity into a lot of my presentations because a lot of entrepreneurs get really um, in their heads about business and I wanna just show you guys, everyone is just trying to figure it out. Whether you're an entrepreneur or a new parent or just a human, I think all of us have that in common, right? There's really no guidebook to life and I think that is the same with every single thing that you're involved in. So I'm very uh, transparent when it comes to um, telling my story. All right, so yes, Cafe Cafe is Kansas City's first and only Vietnamese coffee shop, which is I'm very, very proud of. Um, I, it's not even uh, five minutes away. It's in Columbus Park. Um, if you haven't been there, we welcome you to come. It's very new, um, but I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit about my history and about how it came about. Oh my gosh, sit down. Hi. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of my history. So here's a little collage of me performing. This varies from uh, Broadway tours to high school choir. Um, so I actually grew up in San Diego, California, born and raised to a single mother. Um, I have four older brothers and they're, all my family was born in Vietnam and then they came over here in 1984. So I am the only person in my family to be born here in America and also the only person to be um, going to a four-year university, my family. And of course, I chose musical theater. Not very, uh, um, it was a little bit of a shock to my Vietnamese mother who, there's not even a word for musical theater in the Vietnamese language. So imagine my, uh, you know, uh, trying to explain to my mom what that was. It was very difficult. Oh, yeah, you didn't come in. All right, so I can kind of show you here. Um, I, was very, I was a goody two-shoes in school. I listened to my teachers. I was a brown noser. I stayed after school. I went early. I loved school. School was an escape for me. And also in school, I discovered um, my voice, truly. Um, I joined the choir in sixth grade. Um, because we were trying to look for extracurriculars and robotics just did not sound fun to me. So I auditioned and I really loved it. And I felt like it gave me permission to be zany and outgoing, but um, in a controlled environment where, uh, you know, the teacher could tell me to do that. And I felt, oh, okay, I'm allowed to, to do that. Um, and so as I continued to, to audition, I just stayed in choir and I started to really love singing and, and the stage. And so from sixth grade through 12th grade, um, I went to a low income college prep school and uh, I helped to develop the choir program there and that helped me really become involved in the arts. And so shortly after I decided to audition for a musical theater program for college um, and I went to Cal State Fullerton and I got a BFA in musical theater there. Um, it's one of the top musical theater state schools in California and at the time I was debating what path I was going to go down, whether I was going to pursue education. Education was really um, interesting to me at the time too, but I was like, you know what, I'm just going to jump and I'm going to do musical theater. And this is where it kind of landed me. Um, so after uh, college, I moved to New York and I lived there for 10 years and I auditioned and I was a hustler. I, you know, starving actor, every, everything, all those movies and stories, that was me. I babysat, I catered, I waited, like I was everything that you could think of to try and make ends meet, and including a barista. And so I started working at Starbucks um, when I was 16. It helped me pay for prom, it helped me get through college. I worked in Starbucks all throughout college. Um, so while I was working in the conservatory, I would go to across the street, work at Starbucks, come back, go to rehearsals, perform, every day. And then when I moved to New York, I also continued to work at Starbucks. And um, that's where my interest in coffee kind of came about. Um, but it was never a plan of mine to open a coffee shop at all. Um, so that was a little bit of my performing history. Oh yeah, okay. So oftentimes entrepreneurship can be, you know, just a choice. But for me, it was out of necessity. 
So at the time, it was the pandemic. I was actually on the Broadway revival tour of Miss Saigon. Um, that was my biggest job that I had gotten. Um, I had auditioned for this production for five years. Uh, they had a production in the West End, uh, the Broadway, the Broadway revival, the Broadway replacements, and then finally the tour. And I auditioned for all of those things, and I never got it until the tour. And so this was my dream job. I was working with the, you know, the, com the original directors, the original um, producers, everyone that's from uh, Les Mis, the, everybody from that team was there. And so I felt so honored to finally achieve a Broadway title. And um, so that was starting in 2018, and we were supposed to be on the road for about two years. Pandemic happens, and hi, welcome in. Nice to see you again. And um, yeah, I was actually supposed to be on the road until about um, July of 2020. And so when the pandemic hit, we were in Fort Myers. And I was, I had, you know, in a typical Broadway tour, you're, you pack all your belongings up into two suitcases and they give you one trunk and you're on the road for that for two years. So I had my two suitcases, my um, apartment in New York was being subletted by other actors. And then at that time, obviously none of us really knew what was going on. And so my ex-boyfriend at the time was also on the tour of Miss Saigon. And we were kind of figuring out well, where should we go to wait out the pandemic, right? Um, and he's actually from Kansas City. And so I couldn't go home to California because at the time my mom was very high risk. And we couldn't go back to New York because it was crazy there. So we decided to come to Kansas City temporarily. <laughs> yes. Have I left yet? No. <laughs> um, so we came here and I had no idea what my future was going to look like. Um, four days into um, our show and producers telling us to go home to, to wait for two weeks, uh, we found out that our show was going to close indefinitely, which meant no show was going to, no matter what, even the, if the pandemic was lifted, they were deciding to cancel the show and move on with Les Mis. And in theater, you're, you, it doesn't work like you can't transfer over. Like the cast of Les Mis, they get to keep their job. And my cast, which was actually a company of over 100 people, ended up losing their jobs. It was really heartbreaking, really sad. It was my identity. It was everything that I knew. It was everything I had worked for. Um, throughout college and like just even fighting with my whole family that that struggle to being able to to you know be of course they were very understanding because of the pandemic but i myself was very heartbroken because it was everything to me uh, when you're a, um, a performer it becomes your whole identity so when i moved here i uh, felt very alone um, not just in the fact that i had lost my job as an artist but as an Asian American, um, I didn't know anything about Kansas City other than when we performed here with Miss Saigon, we had gone, um, we were here for two weeks during Christmas, so I got to see the plaza, and I'd fallen in love with the plaza lights, and I was like goo goo gaga over Ward Parkway and all the beautiful, you know, things, and, and then the crossroads was awesome, and I really thought, oh, Kansas City's really cool, so I didn't mind being here, but as uh, you know, starting to live here instead of visiting, I felt very alone. I didn't, f I didn't know where to go to hang out. Um, I wasn't sure where all like the Asians were going to like hang out because in California and in New York, we have tons of plazas. We have tons of like areas that you just go and all your friends, like that's where you hang out. Um, there's lots of Korean barbecue places and lots of boba tea places and things like that. But here. I was like, oh, where do I go? And I was actually very upset about that. Um, I didn't realize that that was something I needed in my life because I had just been so accustomed to that. And when you're thrown out of your environment that you're used to, you realize, oh, uh, I'm missing a sense of home. And so Cafe Cafe was born out of necessity. Um, I had a conversation with my mom. I was crying to her, complaining telling her, I just can't wait to leave Kansas City. I don't know what I'm doing here, blah, blah, blah. Can't make any money, I don't know. And she's like, stop crying. I did not raise a daughter to be like this. Um, and she really you know, put me into perspective and said, what about all the other Asian Americans or Asians that feel the same way that you do, but will never pursue trying to create community? You know, um, Why don't you just make something? 
So my mom was correct. <laughs> um, and I decided to try and make my own friends in a very bold and organic way, which was set up a little table that was probably this big and sell coffee. <laughs> so let's see. There's my first iteration of Cafe Cafe. So cute, right? <laughs> so I like to call this the lemonade stand outside of a nail shop moment. So we all have moments in our lives, right? And this was a very pivotal moment of mine where I spent a good month, month and a half developing all my branding, had time. Um, while I actually was on the tour, I decided to go to different coffee shops and explore every single city's coffee shop just to, because I love coffee shops. I think it's such a wonderful environment to be. And when you're on the road, um, you go from hotel to hotel, different city to different city, and you feel very out of place. And so I wanted my normal routine to be a coffee shop. And so I would go to different coffee shops. I'd start taking notes and kind of taking pictures of each shop. So I had about a month into the pandemic where I started to develop my, my branding and my colors and picking out my name and doing all those things. And finally one day I was like, okay, I'm gonna make Vietnamese coffee since it's part of my culture and it's what I know and I'm gonna sell coffee and I'm gonna see who's gonna let me pop up outside of their shop for a few hours a day and start Instagramming and just start trying to promote my business. And so I first contacted Sassy Nails, which is right outside of Westport. And predominantly, a lot of um, nail salons are owned by Vietnamese um, families. Um, and this traces way back to the war when a lot of refugees came. Um, there was a program that was developed in Northern California where um, a woman had taught a lot of Vietnamese refugees how to do nails so that they can make a sustainable living. And that really just took off and um, became a family business and just spread like crazy throughout California and throughout the United States. So I felt very comfortable reaching out to nail shops because I could speak to them in Vietnamese. I knew that at least a few Asian people would be there. And so I would re reach out to a few nail shops in town and would ask them if I could sell my coffee and they would say yes and so that's what I would do a few times a week um, making some money trying to build a you know um, any type of business but mainly I wanted to meet friends I wanted to meet people that were interested in Vietnamese coffee or the culture that were I don't know could find me on social media so I knew that at least a few people like could understand and navigate social media and then um, yeah purpose like honestly I was doing it out of selfishness of trying to create my own little community here. And so that was the first iteration of it. This is the second iteration of it. So I did that for a few months and then I started a Kickstarter and took all my money from my tour and poured it into this cart. And this cart is truly <laughs> my baby <laughs> in every way. I poured so much time and effort into this. And if you do not come from the food and beverage place, whatever, it, food truck life is very difficult to everyone. <laughs> it might seem fun and glamorous, but I had no idea how difficult running a food truck was going to be. It's very, very hard. And that took a lot of my physical and, and mental and just a lot of energy. However, it just paid off so much because what I was able to do was bring myself and my culture to different pockets of Kansas City. I could travel different places. So I would go pop up around Strawberry Swing. We would go to the West Bottoms. We had a few places in Lee Summit, Independence. And I was able to meet a lot of cool people and be able to tell my story about my losing my job and being an artist, but also feeling kind of like I don't have a close-knit um, API community here. And that's what I'm trying to kind of see if uh, the AAPI people would come out and visit my cart, then I could be like, hey, do you want to be friends? And literally, I, that's what I would do. And some of my best friends now that I did that to work at my shop now or are some of my best friends because they would come visit the cart. And I'd be like, I know this is so forward, but do you want to have dinner? Like, do you want to have coffee with me? Can you tell me where to go? Can you tell me where to shop? Where's the best food places? Um, 
and yeah, that was really my networking tool, was bringing my coffee shop around to different places. Then we moved inside of a warehouse um, down in the West Bottoms for about six or seven months during the winter. And um, we were able to emulate um, coffee shop culture, having a place for you know a certain amount of time and got to see people come in. We set up some chairs, we had Wi-Fi. It was really like a, a practice go for a brick and mortar for us. And right here, I don't know if you can see her, that's Madoka. <laughs> she was also on the tour of Miss Saigon and she moved here for me. I asked her um, if she had anything you know, going on, which I knew she didn't because all of us had no jobs. <laughs> and I said, please, you should move here. I don't have any friends. You could help me build this. You know, it could be temporary. She's still here. <laughs> and she moved here and helped me develop Cafe Cafe. She and I worked every single day. We never took lunch breaks. We never did any, you know, of course, at that time, um, customers were, you know, here and there. But we really, together, would develop, you know, plans um, where we should go, what we should do. And she is um, an immigrant. She's Japanese. And so having her input and having a, an immigrant's input into my brand was really insightful because um, I'm, you know, I was born and raised here. And so my, my um, perspective of being Asian is so very different than hers. And so this really helped paint a beautiful layer to Cafe Cafe. And it helps me be very mindful about how many um, different sectors there are within the Asian culture. Um, soon after we had gone to the West Bottoms, there was a horrible incident in Atlanta where eight Asian women were slain at a salon. And um, one of our customers came up to us and asked, do you know if the city is doing anything to um, honor these women? And I was like, probably not, because it wasn't really on the mainstream news quite that much, um, at, at least here in Kansas City. And so um, that really upset my customer. And she was like, I really think we should do something. Um, can we do something? And I said, yes, let's do something. So this kind of began my journey um, into realizing the necessity of my coffee shop in Kansas City. I, of course, so many things happened in your life, it's just so unexpected, right? And this was a huge thing that happened in my life that really was um, a pivotal moment again. And we held this vigil in the West Bottoms and we taught, um, we set out planters where we taught people how to light incense because in the Asian culture, when someone passes away, we honor them and their lives by lighting incense, usually at an altar or at a temple, um, but it's not a candlelit um, vigil. We wanted to do a, an incense vigil. And we did a prayer in Vietnamese. We had um, Emily Rev Weber um, and also Ri Shu, who are both representatives in Missouri and in Kansas, who are AAPI. We had them speak. Um, we had um, that customer that came, she spoke because her family, she has kids and she was going through a um, fear of her kids being attacked in school, so she was also a speaker. And um, we saw that the community really showed up. Over 500 people came out that day and um, the city really, and there's also Paige, Paige is inter was interpreting as well. <laughs> And yes, it, I love her. And so this was a moment where we, we encouraged people of all of everyone to come and to celebrate and to honor these women because we wanted to show Kansas City that there is an Asian population here in Kansas City. There, we pay taxes. We make up your nurses, your doctors. You know, so many people in Kansas City here are Asian and yet how, how is there not um, a community center or anything to celebrate that part of Kansas City? And I know that Kansas City is, is much better than that. Um, and, and so I wanted to create something that would honor those women, but it was just so much bigger than I anticipated. Soon after that, we started to expand. I hired more people, and then we moved outside to the west side, and we started to serve in the summer we would do events every week um, where I would allow other people to pop up in the same parking lot as I, whether they were black owned, women owned, queer owned, 
Um, I started to do, like during Black History Month, we'd, I'd only support black owned businesses. For, and then during Pride Month, only queer owned businesses. Um, selfishly again, because I wanted to make small business friends. <laughs> but I also wanted to do what Sassy Nails did for me, which was give me a break, honestly. I didn't charge anyone, like we were sharing a parking lot, you know, it was like, no, just pop up with me. Let's sell our stuff together and let's try and do this together and learn together. Let's learn about social media together. Let's talk about business woes. Let's talk about being people of color together, um, trying to start our own businesses. And honestly, some of the people are some of my best friends today. Um, and that was kind of what kind of built the handbook and the guidebook of Cafe Cafe today. So we start just popping up everywhere. We try to do everything that we possibly can to start raising money because I knew in my heart that Cafe Cafe needed some roots. Um, but I come from a family that, you know, my mom is, you know, high school, barely high school educated, um, single mother, low income, food stamps, housing. We, I didn't have any guarantor or anyone that could sign things for me. I didn't qualify for any loans. I had no assets. When you're an actor, you do not have assets. We, I'm telling you right now, it's such a, oh my gosh, the job is very, very difficult to, you know, you're just constantly in the art and they're not very, they're not paid very well, unfortunately. So I had nothing to my name. Um, so we definitely started to do as many pop-ups and door knocking and as much as we could because this was a space in Columbus Park that we were coveting. Um, Columbus Park is very special to me because when I moved here, um, I would always ask my ex-boyfriend to take me to Vietnam Cafe because that was like the best place that reminded me of my mom's cooking. And I was like, oh, I love the staff. They treat me like family. They speak Vietnamese to me and like they cook so well and it just, I would go every single week to Columbus Park. And then we discovered uh, Happy Gillis, which is in Columbus Park, and it was like a really family-oriented, amazing little brunch place. And the more that I learned about Columbus Park, that I learned that there was a huge, oh, oh. <laughs> I learned that there was a big Vietnamese population there um, of immigrants that actually came and stay and actually settled in Columbus Park and that was actually low-income housing there for Vietnamese people back in the day um, and if you're not co familiar with Columbus Park it's also really rich in Italian Sicilian immigrant history so I thought coffee Vietnamese coffee Italian like espresso seems like Columbus Park is the perfect place um, and Columbus Park didn't have a coffee shop at the time or ever I think not for a long time and so I thought this would be such a perfect place because I, if I go to this area for comfort, I'm sure other Vietnamese people and other Asian people would feel comfort in the way that I do too. So we coveted this spot and we, I'm telling you for a year, it was crazy. I applied for every grant. I pitched for every single pitch, even if I did not qualify for it. Like I just hustled so much um, because I really wanted to build this and I also wanted to make sure that, you know, something in my life is I never had any type of generational wealth. Uh, my family has none. And so I thought, how, what's, the, what's the best way to start building that as a young 30-year-old um, in my life? And that was very clear to me that I was not going to take out a loan. I did not want to spend the first five years of my business, trying to pay it back, and then start trying to build wealth. So that's why I was relentless and tenacious in not, um, you know, having to sign a loan. And in my mind, um, I also wanted to set an example for other low-income kids, lo other kids that might have grown up in poverty like I did, because they're not like it is not just walking into the door and getting a loan, like. I tried. A lot of people were actually against my technique of um, GoFundMe and asking for donations and selling because a lot of people were like, well, why don't you just do it like, like everyone else? And I was like, I am not, we are not like everyone else. We don't have access to resources. We don't have, you know, I can't just walk in and say, can you give me $100,000? Uh, I have no guarantor, I have terrible credit, I have no assets, like nothing to my name. I'm also a woman of color. 
without any prior business uh, experience, there's no way I'm going to get um, a loan or, or the ability to, to do that properly within the time frame that I needed to, to survive, honestly. So I decided to fundraise and do it all myself so that I could cut the ribbon with zero loan debt. Um, I have a little bit of credit card debt, but that's okay. That's manageable. Um, but I wanted to show other kids that were like me that they could start their own businesses and do it uh, and in a very unconventional way. Um, and we did. And yay! When I tell you it was very difficult, um, it was very difficult. Um, and the hardest part actually was for me the criticism at that time um, because like I can stand in front of an audience and talk about my story. I'm very comfortable with, with people. I'm very comfortable with pitching. I can tell people why I need the money, what I need it for, you know, um, all those things. But what I was not comfortable with was people telling me, oh, you're doing this the wrong way. Oh, you just want a handout. Like those things, I feel like I grew up listening to a lot. But then as an adult who I'm just trying to make means and make a way for myself and try to represent my community in a, in a positive light, I think I misunder, I, I, I just like did not understand why so much criticism was happening at that time towards me um, and, and what I was trying to build. But that actually lit a fire under me to continue to do it and to continue to prove people wrong because that's the best payback is success. <laughs> and I really wanted to show, hey, like that's really unfair of you to make all of those assumptions that I'm not working hard. In fact, this, I'm doing, this is twice as hard as you think. And um, so my story has so many layers to it and the reasons why I do certain things is very intentional. Um, because when I grew up, I didn't have a lot of examples like that. And so I wanna create that for other Vietnamese American kids, um, especially because in our culture, um, the older generation is focusing on surviving. They got here, they just wanna survive. Um, and now the younger generation, our kids, the kids' kids, are focusing on thriving. How do we build more than that? How do we leave our kids with something more? Um, how do we, you know, because our parents had no education. They were just trying to figure things out here. I had the amazing, you know, opportunity to be educated, to have resources, um, and to understand that I could thrive versus just survive. And so Cafe Cafe is the beginning of me trying to do that. This is us cutting the ribbon. And um, here's Madoka and myself, and then Jason, who is now our general manager, who joined us. So it was first me, and then it was Madoka, and then it was Jason that joined. Um, and then there's Mayor Q, um, which Madoka likes to call him Q-chan. <laughs> <laughs> so every time he comes to an event, we're like, Q-chan. <clears throat> but this is my whole staff now, um, which is incredible and so beautiful, and um, took a lot of work and a lot of, um, but. To be honest, friend, customer, friend, <laughs> customer, all, everyone was started as a customer because they just came and, and felt like very drawn to Cafe Cafe. So I'd be like, oh, come back. Like, we're having another party here. Like, come back. We're doing this. And eventually they'd be like, oh, do you need help? And I'm like, yes, I need help. Can you, can you go pick up some milk? Thank you. Okay, I need some ice. Go, 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 go. Okay, go, go, go. And they're like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> And in the Asian culture, it's very much like we're family. And if you need something, you, go, you just do it. If my mom's here, she's going to tell you, oh, can you go get that? Yes, ma'am. You go grab it. And so a lot of my friends just understood that and would come and help me. And eventually I'd be like, you want to just work for me? And they're like, yeah. So um, most of my staff now have quit their jobs and become full-time Cafe Cafe employees. And so this is a little bit of inside of my shop. Um, everything that you see, um, this was painted by an Asian, a queer Asian tattoo artist. This was designed by a Vietnamese American graphic designer. Um, everything is really intentional in my shop so that I can showcase other people um, within our community as well. Um, I see every opportunity as an opportunity to share. And so I want to really share my place and my, because I really have this abundance mindset where it's from my mom, truly, um, where in poverty you don't have much, but whatever you do have, you share. 
and because you know that's how you survive and that's that's what I truly believe in as well is all I know and so I share my space with all of these these people and one thing I'm also very proud of in relating this to entrepreneurship and to diversity and everything 100% of my employees are all from marginalized communities so whether that is they're they're women they're artists queer black immigrants or API and I've done this very purposefully because I worked at a corporate company um, while I was building this brand um, as their marketing and as their new um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and I was the token, which means you are the filling the quota of the person of color in your company. And that is very alienating and it's very disheartening because as much as you love that this is the change is happening, it's very sad to know that it's just now happening and you're just now creating this job to create diversity within your company. And I did not want any of my employees to ever feel like a token ever again. And so I wanted my whole company to make up of all marginalized communities, all, di all diversities, all types of people um, because that's what the world looks like. You know, when we look around this room, it's colorful, it's vibrant, it's so diverse. And I wanted my company to reflect that. I also wanted my team to be that so that I can somehow create this inner community within my cafe and support them. So while I interviewed, um, although some of them are my friends, yes, in the interview process, what one of my biggest um, interview questions was, what is your five-year plan and dream? And it cannot be Cafe Cafe, unless you, are, you want to be like part of Cafe Cafe or build your own coffee shop. But a lot of them are like, I want to be um, a tattoo artist. I want to own my own tattoo shop. Or I want to have my own bar one day. Or I want to be a Broadway stage manager. Or I want to you know, um, travel and move and um, see the world. And I said, okay, well, the, the goal is for Cafe Cafe to help you achieve that. And because I don't want you to be stuck here. That's not the goal here. The goal is that you can utilize everything that Cafe Cafe can provide for you and be re use it as a resource because we are all part of the minority here. And if I'm fostering a really amazing, diverse, and fun environment where they're all trying to step towards their own dreams, my money and the, the things that I do um, is more driven. I, I feel more driven to do more events. I feel more driven to make more sales. I feel more driven to um, do more good for the community because I know that that paycheck is helping Rebecca pay for her, you know, UMKC degree in, in opera so that she can move to New York. You know, so I have these very purposeful goals within my team because they're all part of those marginalized communities. So I am also helping the diversity within Kansas City thrive as well. So that's one of my goals, which is what, you know, Chelsea does with her company. She's trying to really showcase all these black owned businesses and help them thrive by, by creating a hub. And that's what I'm trying to do within my coffee shop is create this hub. Um, because there's also no um, community center in Kansas City for the AAPI community. And so I decided to take on that responsibility for a while. Um, and that's okay. Um, hopefully that's not gonna be forever, uh, <laughs> but it is something that I'm really passionate about and that I, I feel very motivated um, because when I, of course I'm not from here, but a lot of my staff is from here and they're like, we never knew what it was like to have an Asian community. And to me that breaks my heart because that's what all I, uh, that I know. And so, I really feel like for some reason I'm put here in Kansas City and um, because I'm loud and tenacious, <laughs> I uh, will be um, continuing to do that. And I'm gonna plug a little bit um, this weekend, we're actually doing our second annual AAPI Heritage Festival. Um, so little backstory, last year, or the year before that, Kansas City did not recognize AAPI Month officially and this is 2021, they did not, up until our vigil happened. We got a little phone call from the mayor being like, we're gonna create um, 
a proclamation that officially announces May as AAPI, you know, Heritage Month. And I was shocked and I was so grateful that we actually could create that. Um, so after that decree and the proclamation was printed, I was like, oh yes, the city recognized it, right? Like it's official on paper, yay. Like we're, we're on the map. Um, and then last year, May was coming up and I was like, oh, I wonder if the city's gonna do any type of celebration for a Prime Month. I was like calling up people and I was on the Parks and Rec board. I was like, is there any, anything happening? And they're like, not that we've heard of. And I was like, well, what? Like, there's nothing, like no celebration, like no nothing. Um, so in three weeks, we planned a festival, um, my coffee shop and my employees. And it was great. It was so wonderful. A lot of people came out. And then this year, I decided not to wait. And I was like, you know what? I, I really don't think they're going to plan something, so I'm going to do it myself. And we started planning in January. And so now um, we have over 40 small business vendors who are all AAPI. Um, we have every, every performer is API, including our DJ. And we're flying in people from California and from Omaha um, to come and perform and to bring more culture. Um, we have so many just like, uh, there's going to be Laotian food, Korean barbecue, um, Thai food, all these types of beautiful cultures within the Asian culture um, that's going to be present there. So I really hope all of you can make it. Yes, it's uh, Saturday. It's free. We're giving out a lot of free stuff. We're gonna have. It's kid friendly, dog friendly. Um, it's right in Columbus Park Square. It's the, the beautiful park that's across from Don Bosco Center, and um, yeah, it's 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 something that my coffee shop has worked really hard on, and I'm really excited for it. Um, but with that, you know, uh, what we do is we we really do try to amplify the API community here. We try to show people how beautiful and how rich our culture is. Um, whether that's through the events that we do or even through the coffee that we serve. Um, my coffee shop is the only coffee shop here in Kansas City that serves beans from Vietnam, um, that supports the farmers in, in Vietnam. We're the only coffee shop that does that with um, Southeast Asian flavors as well. And then we brew our, our traditional Vietnamese coffee in the traditional way. And so, um, I, I welcome you to come. You can also also order it, and so you can see it being brewed in the traditional Vietnamese way. So you get to experience that culture as well. And you know, I grew up with that, and so it's very normal for me. But it's an it's such a wonderful, positive experience for other people who get to come in and who've never experienced that before. So that's a little bit about me and Cafe Cafe. Um, thank you for listening to my story. I'm very appreciative of that. <laughs> I do want to take some time to answer questions. Again, I tell, I'm so very passionate about connecting with people and opening up conversations because I think they're so important to have. So I'm very open. We can answer questions about anything. My life, API, whatever you think. And I have a microphone, so I'll come up to you so you can speak. Yes. Oh, OK. What's your favorite beverage? Ooh. I have many, but. So she said, what is your favorite Broadway show? My favorite Broadway show to watch is The Color Purple. Um, I got to see it on Broadway with Cynthia Rebo, and it changed my life. Um, and then my, my favorite show to be in is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> I did eight years of that. I, I'm sure you saw that picture of me with a Grinch. Um, I did eight years of that um, every holiday season. And it just is very sentimental to me. I met some of my best friends in that, so it's just very fun. Yeah. Any other questions? I know you have some questions. It could be about entrepreneurship as well, business, um, diversity, coffee, whatever you think you'd like to ask. Yes. Hold on. Can you speak in the mic for us? Sorry. We're live streaming. They want to be able to show it so that everyone can hear. Excuse me, ma'am. Did you buy the building? Oh, no, I did not. I would love to <laughs> eventually. But we have a wonderful landlord who has who is also part of the arts. He's, he used to be a documentary director, and so he's very lenient with all the creativity, all the things that we plan. Because I was a little nervous, because I'm very tenacious, and I'm like, oh, I want to do all these things. And he is wonderful, and so he's been very supportive of our journey. Yeah, so we're on a three-year lease right now. 
Hello? Okay. I have a question. Um, what is the biggest lesson you've learned in your entrepreneurial journey? Um, that being yourself is more than enough. Um, I, have, I have found more success by being completely authentic and myself than I ever have been in show business where I thought I was being myself. Um, but this has just taught me to be very comfortable in my skin. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually like, it's given me permission to be okay with the fact that I am so flawed and I am so, like, I, I did not come from a business background. I had to Google and YouTube and, and ask questions and just every day is a new thing where I'm just like, I feel like an idiot. Um, but I gave myself permission to be like, that's okay. And I think that lesson is really good in life as well. Because um, right now it's funny, I talk to a lot of my girlfriends who are just now having children for the first time. I'm like, how is it? They're like, don't know, figuring it out, minute by minute. And I'm like, that sounds like entrepreneurship. <laughs> Literally, don't know how this next minute's gonna go, but you're gonna figure it out. And I think it's given me more sense of like being malleable and flexible. Um, it's given me thick skin, thicker skin than I already had. Um, but I think I, I just gave my per myself permission to be a human being because you're in control of everything that you do. And so I just was like, if it's so difficult, like old, whole, um, owning a business is already so difficult. Why am I making things more difficult by just like putting on these extra masks and guards? Might as well just put those things down, be myself. So that because everything else is really hard anyway, you know, so. What are your thoughts on representation in Broadway? Oh my goodness. Um, one of the biggest reasons why I'm not back is because it is very, it's very racist on Broadway. It's very hard. Um, I, uh, I didn't know that, like going and studying it and like, you know, doing all that in school and then moving to New York. I was so desperate to work and so desperate to be an artist and so desperate to dance and sing. Um, your, your entire being becomes uh, an artist. And I've done five productions of Miss Saigon. And if you're not familiar with that production, it talks about the Vietnam War. Um, and so I was always one of the few Vietnamese people who were actually trying to portray Vietnamese people. But there were so many times where I felt like I was not doing the right thing because the director was not being mindful about our culture or the choreography for or directors or casting they just want to make sure that the show gets up they don't care about authenticity they don't care about anything it's like a money maker and Hollywood and Broadway are very the same in that um, what you look like you have to portray right um, so sometimes if you look like something that's what you're gonna portray even if that's not who you identify as. And that can be very um, hard to, to kind of go back and forth and like code switch all the time and, and you feel like a puppet. And I, I did not realize all those things until I was out of it. Um, and it's taking, I thought the pandemic would truly change New York and a lot, but there are still a lot of problems that are existent in that um, performing arts. Um, so there's not a lot of representation for the API community. However, there have been attempts that like, there's just been a show called K-pop and now there's a show called Here Lies Love where it talks about, for the first time on Broadway, there's an all Filipino cast that's talking about a Filipino um, story. And that's the first time, this is like happening right now. And that was actually the first audition that I went back into New York earlier this year was that show, which I was like, should I even audition? I'm not Filipino, like, <laughs> but Filipinos auditioned for Miss Saigon. And so I was like, I'll give it a whirl. I haven't, you know, auditioned in three years and it was a wonderful experience, but they decided to finally cast appropriately where every single person in that cast is Filipino. And so it's moving, it's moving at a very slow pace, but it's moving. And so um, that's all I can ask for. Obviously I would love for it to go even quicker, but there's a lot of things like um, movies like Crazy Rich Asians or Everything Everywhere All at Once. Like that really is putting Asian artists on the map. K-dramas as well are putting Asians on the map. K-pop is as well. It's
creating this sense of, um, wow, uh, international popularity that we never had before, um, which is new to me. I never in a million years thought I would see people going to a BTS K-pop concert where it's all people of every single colors and everything singing Korean. I was like, what? I grew up with the Spice Girls, you know? So it, it, it's, it's very amazing. Um, but I sometimes feel kind of torn because I, it gets a little, I, I feel sad for my younger self. Because I'm like, oh, I really wish I had that growing up. And I'm happy that I have it now. And I'm happy that my nieces and nephews had it. But there's a sense of me that I'm like, oh, like, I wish I could have been one of those like girls looking up to the, the Asian girls in black, pink, and feeling cool. I, I, I did not feel cool growing up. I felt very alienated, and I wanted to be Britney Spears, and I wanted to be blonde. But um, I'm grateful for it now. Yeah. You said, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, you said you, your mother was single mother. Yes. Uh, what happened with your dad? My father was not in the picture. And so my father was also Vietnamese, um, but he's just not in the picture. And my, all my brothers are my half brothers and their, their father is an American GI or was an American GI, he passed. So how my mom was able to come to America was because she had had children with um, an American GI in, in Vietnam. Yeah, so my father's not part of my life. So I just grew up with my mom and my brothers. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, we have a question from our live stream here. Yeah. How are you able to make Cafe Cafe brand feel heard in such a saturated place like Instagram? I think one thing I love about, so I love social media. So it, it brings me joy because it, it makes me feel like it's, first of all, it's free. And a lot of entrepreneurs, I have to like remind people like that is a free thing and that's a tool. You know, um, when I was in college and, and getting into like, you know, after college, Instagram was social. Now it's not, it's, it's not a social tool anymore. It is definitely more of a branding tool of a, you know, connecting tool and it's a business tool. And so I look at it like, thankfully, cause I come from a show business background, I, th I think of Instagram as commercials. And as much as you keep posting, that's like more uh, online time, right? Like more time on the Super Bowl, like you are telling people about your shop. I just have fun with it. I really do. I love like having photo shoots and being wacky and zany and also educating. Um, I think our whole world is saturated. Like show business is saturated, coffee shop business, like every, every industry we're in, Everyone's trying to find a niche, but really, like, I think if you think about it, everything is saturated. So, I, if, if I, my best advice is what, what we do is we just have fun. We don't look at numbers. We don't look at followers. We don't look at likes. Like, we just post what we want and we hope that people look at it. And we know that it's a tool to communicate. Um, I started my, my business in the pandemic. So, that was the only way I could communicate to anybody. Um, I couldn't go anywhere. There weren't like open things like we were masked. So I really used my Instagram as a platform to be like, hey, how are you? Like, I'm still the person that runs my Instagram. So anytime you message, it's me still talking because I love being able to be like, oh, text me. Like, just message me because that is me. I swear. Like, you can talk to me. Um, so I, use, I just think of it as a communication and also free commercials. So that makes me excited because I'm utilizing a free resource that's good and that works. Yeah. So the um, Postman is a really good drink. Thank you. And the donuts are good also. Are those made locally here? Yeah, so um, it's funny, the mailman, that drink is actually named after our mailman, Vince. <laughs> so Vince would come in um, down at, down at, uh, when we had a temporary thing. He's like, I like chai. I don't really want like anything coffee. So we were like, we're gonna make a drink for you and see if you like it, and he loved it. So that's all he would get all the time. So we just started calling the mailman. And then we were like, you know what, we're gonna have something for you. And he's like, no, you're not. And now it's on our menu. Um, so that's actually dedicated to our literal mailman. Um, but the donuts, yes, they're actually made from a company called Mr. D's. 
They are located in Shawnee. They're also AAPI owned. Um, so all of our pastries are from AAPI bakers. We have egg tarts that are made from a Vietnamese baker. Um, we have uh, ube muffins and blueberry muffins from a Thai baker. And then all of our donuts are from Mr. D's, which they are Mongolian and Taiwanese. And they hand make every single donut, like every single one, glaze and make every hand. And they're phenomenal. And now a lot of coffee shops here actually have carry them. Um, Chinggu, Oddly, Blip, High Tides, a lot of coffee shops now are offering Mr. D's, which I'm really excited because that means they're getting more popular, they're getting more business, so it makes me happy. And they just had twin girls, so I was like, I know you need more business. <laughs> um, but yeah, we really try to support um, other local API businesses within our shop so that no matter what you do, no matter where, what you buy, um, you're supporting an API company. Do we have other questions or are we wrapping it up? I, last call, you know, it takes about eight seconds. Another. There you go. <laughs> Obviously coming in, and I will also attest to the amazing everything I've ever had there. Um, what are other ways that Kansas Cityans could show support to your business? And then I just want to give you a minute if you want to plug the keychain. Oh, yeah, I want you. Um, I have had this question asked many times, um, and I'm going to answer it in two different ways. Like, how to support us personally is always just going to be telling people about us. Word of mouth is going to be the, the most helpful thing um, because social media can, can help a lot, and following and reviewing us on, on Yelp and stuff. But for me, the old school way is definitely just being like, hey, I found this really amazing place because that's when I, when I look for recommendations, it's my friends telling me, oh my God, did you check this place out? You have to go. So word of mouth is the, such an amazing tool that I think a lot of people don't really understand nowadays because we're so attached to our little phones, but can be very powerful. So please just tell people. Tell people about us and what we do and um, why we do it. And I think that is just a really amazing start. Um, how to support the API community within Kansas City is going to be um, asking questions. I really feel like sometimes People want to be supportive and they want to learn, but they're afraid of um, offending someone, so they stay quiet. And I think that that's not the best way because we can't just, we don't learn in silence. Um, we have to learn by action. And I really think if you have an Asian friend, it is okay just to say, how are you today? Can I buy your coffee this, this month, uh, uh, this day, or whatever? Um, you know, is there anywhere that you love to eat? Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Like, because I guarantee you, just asking that about them, you'll learn about their history, whether they, their parents are you know, immigrants or refugees or if they're third generation Chinese. You know, I think learning about the, the community is your first step towards amplifying their voices because then they're not invisible anymore. You're creating a conversation between people. Um, so I love questions. I love when people are like, hey, I'm not trying to be offend as offensive, but you know, can you tell me what's the difference between you know the Vietnamese culture and maybe the Thai culture? And I'm like, yeah, I'll absolutely tell you that because it makes me happy that you're willing to want to learn. Um, so if you have any Asian friends, check in on them. Um, it is difficult to be Asian in the Midwest because there's not a lot of resources. Uh, there's not any news outlets that are willing to cover our news. There's no community center. Um, and th truly, there's like the Asian Chamber of Commerce and that, but those people, th that only meets every so often. And so if you check in on them, make sure that they're okay. And I think that that's like a wonderful way to start your, your allyship. That's not offensive. It's not generic. It's the, the people that are in your lives that you don't you know, identify as Asian. Like, please do just reach out and ask them how they're doing. Um, yeah, so those are the best ways to support us is word of mouth. Obviously, please do follow us on Instagram. I, I'm a little cuckoo on there. so. I might entertain you every so often. Um, but yeah, just come in, have some coffee. Um, that's a wonderful way to support us, too. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank everyone. Thank you. And I do want to shout out, she's such a good friend of mine, and she does so much for the black com like community here and black-owned businesses. And please do follow KC Black Owned. They do wonderful work. We've worked with them so many times, and she's like 
a hard worker. She deserves it, and she's has a baby, and I just am so in awe. Like, I don't even have kids, and I, like, don't even know, and you do so much with a kid. It's like, so please do support her. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, seriously. Thank you. Oh, this is just so special. This is like gathering. I feel so warm in my heart. It could be postpartum. Um, but um, I just want to talk to you guys about our keychain. So we're, we're highlighting AAPI um, month, but um, something you can do, this is the month that we highlight it, but what I try to challenge the community with is to do this all year long. So yes, February, June, okay, May, but let's do it all year long, right? And then we highlight and amplify during those months. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I want to make sure it makes sense. So what I'm trying to do um, to really amplify and bring visibility and awareness to black-owned businesses is I've created a keychain. If you think about probably when I was in school, we would come by with this thick coupon book, and we would say, okay, uh, we have this coupon book, and um, it's, I think it was $25, and it's an entertainment book. You, get, you can bring them to me, honey. You can get any coupon from a local business. That's how I would get pizza. So what I'm trying to do in a modern stance in Kansas City is to highlight the brick and mortar spaces that have bills to pay, like their overheads and et cetera. So the combine, Ruby Jeans, um, really challenging us to kind of leave our house, go to the crossroads, go to Truist, go to those places where they are, and in return you get a discount. What kind of discount, Chelsea? Well, you can get either 10, 15, or 20% off. So for instance, if I go to the combine, grab a slice, I can get 15% off my slice of pizza. And the slice of pizza at the combine is huge. So you'll be full. This is kind of an ongoing way. It's a small keychain. I don't know if you have your keys, but it's a small keychain. It doesn't take over your keys. It's not heavy on the ignition. You simply go up, you place your order, and they'll say, okay, and you'll say, wait, I have my KC Black-owned Kickstarter keychain. You'll just show it. The employee should just tap a little button, and then you get your percent off. And so this is an ongoing thing. Um, it's a very branded and well-marketed um, keychain. It's very small, like I said. And this is just a way for you to access Black-owned businesses all year long. We're in the process of helping online businesses with this, but our main focus is those brick-and-mortar spaces. We need to get out, get off the couch, go for a walk and go into those spaces. But yeah, Jackie and I, um, I don't know, I just seen so much of myself and you. I was a teacher, I got laid off um, during COVID. I mean, I have my PhD in education and now I'm an entrepreneur. So um, if you wanna talk to my mom about her struggles, she would love that. Um, but continue to tell people, share, um, just talk to us. If you have questions, highlight us. Jackie had something to say. Mm -hmm. Yo! So Paige actually is one of our good friends. And every single person that works at Cafe Cafe is required to take a, an ASL class um, for baristas through the whole person because Paige has brought in so many deaf and hard of hearing customers into our shop. So we now make that a requirement because that is also another marginalized community. And so we have a lot of people who you know, our friend here comes to our shop all the time. We want to make sure that our baristas at least know how to say coffee, um, milk, um, how to finger spell so that they can communicate or, or, or understand the nuances, like making sure there's a phone by the register with the notes app so that you can communicate with them and show them. Those are little instances that we want to bring awareness to, to our shop, that that also shows in inclusivity and ability to communicate. So I wanted to just shout out Paige because she's been with us for so long and she's been a really amazing part of building the culture of Cafe Cafe. So inclusivity is not just race, it also is, um, you know, hard of hearing, disabilities, things like that. So I just wanted to shout out to Paige because I love her so much. And if you ever need a interpreter, please contact Paige. Can I say something? Um, um, also partnering with KCPI and that community as well and becoming um, inclusive and uh, you talk about inclusivity and diversity, just being involved with everybody in the Kansas City area, just having everyone involved is a great idea. Yeah. And so I just want to shout out to Paige because 
that is just a wonderful like job and tool and just all around. So, yay. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Please come to my coffee shop and uh, definitely the, the festival this weekend if you can. It's on Saturday. So, thank you. Thank yay. You.